today's motion is Japan's military buildup is threatening regional stability. Um, let me start the initial vote now. This will just take a second. So you should see the question on your screen now, and you can vote yes, no, or I don't know on the question on whether you agree or disagree um, with the motion, Japan's military buildup is threatening regional stability. While you vote, let me outline what we are debating today. Japan is experiencing its own version of the Zeitenwende. For the first time since World War II, the country is planning to acquire counter-strike capabilities. At the end of 2022, it published three new strategic documents, National Security Strategy, National Defense Strategy, and the Defense Build-Up Program, that outline a significant increase in defense spending until 2027. The aim of building stronger alliances with new and existing partners, as well as a focus on cybersecurity. This trend has been long in the making, given the, given the changing security environment around Japan with the threat it perceives from both China's own arming up and the growing tensions between the US and China. In recent months, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has followed up on these announcements and met with many state leaders both abroad and at home, preparing for the upcoming G7 summit in Hiroshima next week. Most remarkably, the relations with neighbor South Korea, which had been bad in recent years, uh, have turned for the better with the second in-person visit and more commitments to, co to cooperate in trade, technology, and security. But Prime Minister Kishida had also been to the Ukraine, to several African countries, and to the US. But will Japan even be able to pay for the plans to upgrade its self-defense forces? Can it find enough young people to join the military in a shrinking society, which has embraced its post-World War II pacifist constitution? Who's going to deliver the arms required to upgrade its military in times of war in Europe? And will arming up Japan actually deter China or any other regional actor from entering any military action or might it raise the chances of an accident turning into conflict? Today, we want to discuss whether Japan's plans will lead to deterrence or rather to a dangerous arms race in Asia. Thank you for your votes. Um, we're now ending the poll. There we go. Um, you will not see the results on your screen and neither will I. Uh, we will only look at these results after the second poll at the end. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our two teams debating today, and I will ask our panelists to now turn back on their cameras and microphones. First, arguing on the side for the motion, John Delury, who is a professor of Chinese studies at Yonsei University and, among many other things, analyst and regular commentator on East Asian affairs, and author of books such as Agents of Subversion, The Fate of John T. Downey and the CIA's Covert War in China, which has just been published, joining us today from Seoul. Hello, John. Hello, great to be with you. And joining him on the team arguing in favor of the motion is Lionel Faton, who is an assistant professor of international relations at Webster University, Geneva, as well as a research collaborator at the Research Institute for the History of Global Arms Transfer at the Meiji University in Tokyo. His newest book is called Japan's Rush to the Pacific War, The Institutional Roots of Overbalancing. And by the way, overbalancing is my new favorite word. Uh, Lionel, of course, is joining us from beautiful Geneva here in Switzerland as well today. Hello. Hi, Nico. Hi, everybody. And then on the side, arguing against today's motion, we have uh, Yuka Koshino, who is a research fellow for security and technology policy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Her research contributes both to the defense and military analysis program, as well as the Japan chair program where she also serves as the co-host of the IISS podcast series, Japan Memo. Yuka is joining us today from London. Hello, Yuka. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for having me. And finally, joining Yuka on the side, uh, arguing against the motion is Ken Moriyasu, who is the diplomatic correspondent for Nikkei Asia, based in Tokyo, but joining us today from Doha, um, where he, Nikkei Asia, where he writes about geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific. He's been a correspondent for Nikkei in Washington, D.C., Cairo, Beijing, Dalian, and New York. Hello, Hello. Ken. Thanks Thank you me. all so much for, for being with us here today. Before we start, just as a quick reminder, um, as in all Oxford debates, the arguments from our panelists may not entirely correspond to their personal views on the subject matter. In fact, we're asking them to argue here for one side, because we believe this helps you, the audience, to understand the issue. 
If you are a member of Asia Society Switzerland, uh, we invite you to join our debriefing session, which starts immediately after the debate has concluded at 1 p.m. Switzerland time. Um, so you can hear a little bit more uh, from the insights of all of our panelists. With that, and without much further ado, it's now my pleasure uh, to hand over to Lionel Fatton, who will deliver the opening statement for the team arguing in favor of the motion, Japan's military buildup is threatening regional stability. Lionel, you have four minutes on the clock. Thank you, Nico. So, whatever the merits of Japan's revamped security posture, which UK and Ken will strive to highlight, and I'm sure will do well, transition periods are intrinsically destabilizing in international affairs. And the point is that Japan is triggering one today. I have three points to make in this regard. First, Japan's acquisition of counter-strike capabilities implies a new division of labor in the Japan-US alliance. The traditional spear and shield structure was based on the assumption that the United States will provide power projection capabilities, while the self-defense forces will protect the Japanese territory. Now that Japan has decided to acquire its own spear, what message does it send regarding the credibility of the American commitment to Japan's defense? What if would-be revisionist countries take this as a sign that the alliance is riddled by mutual distrust? Moreover, while Tokyo and Washington are negotiating a revamp of the alliance structure, which could take years and prove bumpy, the combat readiness and deterrent power of their security partnership may decline, even if temporarily, and invite revisionist moves on the regional scene. This is particularly concerning today in view of the growing tensions in the Taiwan Strait and the Korean Peninsula. Lastly, the fact that Japan has not handled power projection capabilities since 1945 implies that Tokyo will need time to establish the operating procedures and develop the operational culture required for the proper use of counter-strike capabilities. This may result in destabilizing reactions by Japan to regional contingencies, especially Chinese gray zone operations and North Korean missile and nuclear gesticulations. Second point. Japan's ambition to double its defense budget by 2027, becoming the third largest worldwide, will lead to a significant modification of the East Asian geopolitical environment. Such a rapid and drastic modification of the regional environment is by definition destabilizing, because other actors will have to adapt to it. In the short to midterm, Japan's rapid development of a more muscular security policy may come too late and too strong. Instead of strengthening regional deterrence, it may invite revisionist moves triggered by a better-to-act-now-than-later logic. As an example, particularly problematic will be if China thinks it is already strong enough to coerce Taiwan into unification, but perceives Japan's growing military might as sparking a closing window of opportunity. And even if no revisionist move is incited in the short to midterm, in the longer run, the emergence of Japan as a strong regional security actor will likely result in the deepening polarization of the East Asian security landscape. The crystallization of geopolitical blocks, China, North Korea, Russia on the one hand, US, Japan, and potentially South Korea on the other, will raise tensions along the fault line with potentially highly destabilizing consequences in the Taiwan Strait and the Korean Peninsula. Third and last point. Japan's emergence as a strong regional security actor implies its weakening as a stabilizing pole of the East Asian system. A pacifist Japan focused on economic and civilian power was the anchor of the East Asian economic miracle and a central pillar of the East Asian peace. The country contributed heavily to the economic development of the region and at time even paved the way for mending ties between opponents. For example, the Menus Vivendi found in the 1970s between Washington, Beijing, and Taipei would have been much more difficult to find without the so-called Japan formula providing the template. An increasingly security-focused Japan will have destabilizing consequences by negatively impacting its ability to play this role of innovating an influential broker and stabilizer of regional dynamics. Thank you very much, Lionel. Right on the clock, four minutes. That was fantastic. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, we're moving right along to, to hear the opening statement from the team arguing against the motion, which will be delivered by Yuka Koshino from London. Yuka, you have four minutes as well. 
Thank you very much for having me today. In my opening remarks, I would like to make three points on why Ken and I argue against the motion. So firstly, Japan is accelerating its defense investment in response to the deteriorating strategic environment and challenges to the status quo. A lot of people forget that Japan is in the frontline state to deal with the three of the world's major security challenges, China, North Korea, and Russia that Leon has just laid out. But um, since the 21st century, and laterally challenging state in the East China and South China Seas. About Chinese intentions towards Taiwan and a potential deterrence failure in the Taiwan Strait. Japan's westmost, westernmost island, Yonaguni, is only 110 kilometers away from east coast of Taiwan, suggesting that a major contingency could have immediate consequences to Japanese national security. North Korea is also rapidly developing ballistic missiles and nuclear capabilities, and Japan is also facing Russia, a country that is willing to violate international law to invade Ukraine, despite being a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Japan and Russia have not normalized their relationship since World War II and have a territorial dispute over the Northern Territories. So despite such a drastic change to the security environment over the past decades, Tokyo's defense spending had long been constrained by the normatic 1% GDP role until today and remained rather static. China's reported defense spending in 2023, for instance, was um, nearly four or 4.5 times larger than that of Japan, while their spending size was similar back in the early 20, uh, 21st century. This suggests that it is difficult to argue that Japan is the one destabilizing regional security. Secondly, Japan's self-defense forces posture announced investments remain defensive by nature due to its constitution and exclusively defense-oriented policy. In fact, if you actually look at the breakdown of Japan's new 43 trillion yen defense bill that planned to fundamentally reinforce its defense capability, demonstrated its focus on enhancing deterrence and in its response capability in a case of contingency in Japan. Which, which was driven by a realistic assessment that the current force posture or level of investment is insufficient to defend Japan from a potential aggression. More than one third of the budget, for instance, was earmarked for the sustainability and resiliency of Japanese self-transport, such as increasing ammunition stocks and storage facilities. So this is a clear sign that Tokyo doesn't have the intention or capacity for power projection. One might argue that large investments to develop more of a long, longer range uh, missiles, uh, such as the upgraded versions of Type 12 surface to ship missiles or procurement of U.S. Tomahawk missiles and hypersonics weapon systems could seem offensive. However, when the JSDF could use these missiles are limited for defensive purposes. And I'm happy to uh, continue this um, in, in the Q&A. So more fundamentally, Japan's robust defense spending aims at taking primary responsibility to defend its territories like a normal, um, you know, normal sovereign country instead of relying on U.S. forces to defend Japan. A structure of alliance that some U.S. government officials and experts have criticized in the past as Japan being a free rider in its own security. So from a regional point of view as well, Japan, which could defend itself, is critical for regional stability because it allows the U.S. to focus its resources in other parts of Asia to enhance deterrence. And the fact that the three strategic documents were received well by the regional countries is also a strong evidence that its defense spending will not threaten regional stability. And finally, and most importantly, it is important to put defense in the context of Tokyo's overall security strategy to pursue regional stability. The end goal of Tokyo's security strategy is to maintain and develop a free and open Indo-Pacific region. And the 2022 national security strategy clearly states that Tokyo will proactively shape a desirable security environment for Japan through vigorous diplomacy and that defense will play a supporting role for Japan to implement and pursue such a diplomacy. So I'll end my opening comments here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuka-san, for that opening statement arguing against the motion. Um, and we'll move right along for the first rebuttal from the team arguing in favor of the motion, which again is four minutes and will be delivered by John Delury joining us from Seoul. John, you have four minutes. Okay, thank you, uh, Nico. Um, so, you know, our, our colleagues have made a number of important points here, but if we start with sort of the premise, I, the, the premise that I heard is that, you know, if we boil it down, Japan didn't start it, didn't start this problem. Japan is not the cause of instability in the region. It's China, North Korea, and Russia. 
and uh, Lionel may may differ, but I don't think we're really quarreling with that point. The question is not who started it. The question is how to de-escalate the situation and restabilize it, and that and that's what we're being asked to debate. Uh, I think what we're getting from the other side is an argument that we're all familiar with of deterrence. And I, I think of it as, you know, there's the, the debate over is the glass half empty or half full. The deterrence argument is no matter how much you pour in that cup, it's never enough. It's never full. Uh, and we're hearing that argument. Um, I mean, when you see this projection or commitment on the Japanese government to this dramatic increase in defense spending, really unprecedented, as, as Lionel pointed out, since 1945, um, w- where does that stop? You know, if there's a 26% increase for next year, based on the current situation in which there is not military action in the Taiwan Strait, in which North Korea is continuing to do what, what it's been doing actually for, for decades, or at least a solid decade of missile testing, uh, you know, where does this end? And I'm afraid that the argument on the other side, is, it really has no end. You just keep spending more uh, on defense and you encourage basically all actors to play more on defense. And you're stuck in an endless spiral uh, that we describe as a security dilemma. And that brings me to kind of the the second key point that I want to pull out and and dispute and try to rebut, which is, um, you know, this idea that the region welcomed this, or obviously some countries in the region uh, welcomed it. And I think at a superficial level, that would be true of, you know, the country I'm in, South Korea, at least the South Korean government. Uh, again, in Q&A, maybe we can talk more about what I would describe as the real state of the relationship between Japan and South Korea, which remains incredibly complicated. And we shouldn't let the symmetry deceive us. Uh, but putting that aside, when we talk about the region, and how the region is responding uh, to Japan's military buildup and its projections for this dramatic increase in its military buildup, what are the real countries we need to be paying attention to? Of course, Washington is going to welcome this. And OK, Seoul is the government is welcoming. But if we look at the countries we're worried about, which is China, North Korea, uh, and and Russia, then the, the question that we're posing here is, is this increase in military hardware uh, in a range of counter-strike capabilities that, again, are, are quite new, quite unprecedented ground for Japan, is that going to deter these countries and stabilize their behavior, or is it going to actually accelerate us in the direction of risk? And I think that if we carefully look at uh, North Korea, Uh, If you monitor North Korean media, North Korea pays a lot of attention to Japan. Japan is regularly featured as part of North Korea's threat perception, and North Korea is going to match what its neighbors do. So uh, increase in missile defense on the part of Japan is going to mean not less, but more missile activity on the part of Kim Jong-un and North Korea. China's more complicated uh, matter, and there are certainly reasons that Japan and and South Korea and the United States and and all countries in the region uh, need to figure out how to manage uh, China's rise. But simply building up weaponry in Japan and moving Japan, as Lionel said, from a defensive actor to an offensive actor is only going to aggravate relationships uh, with China and make the problem of China's assertiveness more intense. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Delury in Seoul. Um, just a quick reminder to the audience before we move on to the final rebuttal. Um, it's almost time for the Q&A where we welcome your questions. Um, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. The earlier you do it, the more likely it is that we're actually going to get around to answering your questions. And now for the final rebuttal from the team arguing against the motion, Ken Moriasu from Nikkei Asia joining us from Doha. Ken, you have four minutes as well. Thank you, Nico. So I want to stress uh, that the whole purpose uh, of Japan's national security strategy is to restore the power balance. It's not to um, alter um, the the landscape uh, in favor um, of the West, but it's uh, coming from an understanding and a fear that the power balance has shifted too much and that it is dangerous. And there are two elements uh, to this realization. One is that the tremendous missile gap um, of short and medium and intermediate range uh, missiles. Um, China is said to have 2,000. America has zero. Uh, This is a result of the INF Treaty uh, that the US and the Russians 
uh, were restrained by it. And China, not being part of this treaty, has quietly amassed 2,000 missiles. And there's um, a realization in Japan that America alone will probably not be able to fill in this gap uh, within the time frame uh, we're talking about in the next five to 10 years. So that's the first rebuttal to Lionel about the new roles of the US and Japan. Um, Japan uh, knows that you, the US alone um, cannot match this 2000 missile gap. So that's why it's um, taking on not just the, the shield, but part of the spear as well. The other realization is that um, Japan has realized that China is, is intent on changing the status quo. And if there is an opportunity uh, to change the status quo, it probably will. Uh, Japan saw that firsthand in 2010 when the um, fishing boat rammed into a, a, a Japanese Coast Guard vessel. And when Japan arrested the captain, uh, China uh, stopped rare earth exports to Japan. And also in 2012, when Japan nationalized Senkaku Islands to prevent the, the hawkish Tokyo governor from buying it himself, uh, then that kind of led to tremendous uh, protests across China. Um, so, uh, Leno talked about the pacifist Japan being the pillar of the region. Uh, that is true, that was true until today, uh, but uh, there is a feeling that this pacifist um, path will not work uh, under the current Xi Jinping um, uh, regime. And also, um, the fact that uh, whether this um, strengthening of deterrence uh, works or not, um, there's a recent development in China on the Chinese social media that's very interesting. Uh, the Chinese authorities have allowed more commentary uh, to be published about the dangers of a military action on Taiwan. So um, there's talk about the crisis of a forefront uh, crisis for China if China um, embarks on, on a mission to militarily unify Taiwan. Uh, such uh, commentary was um, previously banned in China, but over the last few weeks, China has been uh, allowing these commentary to, to run. Those four crises is one, a Taiwan crisis, of course, China facing Taiwan, US, and Japan. There's a crisis on the Korean Peninsula, where China will have to face the US and South Korea. There's a third crisis in the South China Sea and the South Pacific, where China would have to face the US and Australia under the AUKUS package. And finally, the Himalaya borders, where China will have to face India. So the reason why the Chinese authorities are allowing these commentaries uh, to run is because they fear that the public opinion and the public expectation in China has grown so much that it is limiting uh, Xi Jinping's choices. So they want to defuse it. So I think this is a clear uh, proof that deterrence is working. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. And uh, I want to commend all of our panelists for being incredibly good with sticking to the, the time that was allotted to them. That is uh, not always the case. And uh, you were all doing admirably here. Um, I know this is very, very hard. Uh, let's move into Q&A. And again, uh, welcome questions from the audience here. I do want to start with something that has already uh, kind of come up uh, throughout the opening statements and rebuttals. Um, and, and I want to start with you, John, since you, you, you've kind of announced during your rebuttal that you would like to talk about this some more. So let's talk more about the Japan-South Korea relationship. Um, I said in my introduction, um, you know, that the relationship as of uh, as of recently show certain signs of improving. Um, you alluded that you may not fully agree with this qualification. So how is you know, the change in Japan's defense posture being viewed in Seoul? Is this a positive development um, uh, from a South Korean vantage point um, or are there some ambiguous views and what might be other issues and reasons uh, that sort of threaten the harmonious picture that we may have gotten from the summit tree um, between the two countries. Thanks, Nico. I, I wasn't disputing your characterization, and, and there's no question. I mean, we just uh, here in, in South Korea hosted um, the Japanese prime minister. And again, on the surface, everything sort of went fine, and there is superficial progress between the two governments. But my point is that 
core issues that exist between the South Korean public and the Japanese public. Uh, I'll just present it from the South Korean sort of perspective, as it were. Those have not been resolved and they're rooted, sure, in history, but but this is not a history of a long bygone era. This is precisely the history that Lionel is referencing since 1945. The minute you go before 1945, August 1945, Korea is a colony of a militaristic Imperial Japan. And so, you know, for for Koreans, that history has not been settled. Uh, it is an open question. It's an open wound. Even the governments are trying to kind of, again, paper over it and move forward. But as we see, I mean, I, I would confidently predict that if we see Japan moving in this direction of entering a real arms race and and, you know, through that investment in defense and reposturing of its defense, really changing how it's viewed in the region, South Koreans are as a public are going to be first in line or early in the line of raising deep concerns about what this means for the future of the region and even what this means for South Korea. You know, if we talk about territory, what territory of Japan today is under some, some kind of imminent threat? I suppose we could get into disputed territories with Russia, but China has essentially, uh, you know, very limited to no territorial disputes with, with Japan. That's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about Taiwan and Japan's vulnerability to Taiwan. North Korea does not have territorial disputes uh, with Japan. South Korea has an active territorial dispute over Dokdo and Takashima. And just fly into Incheon Airport and take the train in, and you will see the South Korean perspective on the island of Dokdo is ours with historical proof to back that up. So um, these issues are, are not close to going away. And the further that Japan goes down, what is essentially a military path, the more that you're going to see South Korea raising really serious concerns and essentially seeing it as destabilizing. Thank you. Um, over recent weeks and months, as you know, sort of the internationally, um, uh, those three documents uh, that have come out of Japan have been discussed. One topic that I've seen covered again and again is that there's a fairly clear chance that uh, the Japanese self-defense forces, the SDF, may not actually be up to the job that is being asked of them. You know, we're, we read of, of budgetary issues, we read of, um, uh, of issues of just not having enough people. Um, so Yuka, I want to ask you, you know, sort of how, in how good a shape are the Japanese self-defense forces? Right? Is it even realistic that um, they can deliver, they can deliver um, on this buildup um, that is being planned now? Can they recruit enough people? Um, can they train those people well enough um, in a country that is aging um, and that has sort of adopted a pacifist stance? Is that even realistic? It is not the sort of an, a strategy that's doomed to fail um, because of these internal factors already? Sure. Um, maybe I'll make a, I have several points, um, but I think I'll start from um, the fact when I mentioned um, Japan's new uh, kind of JSDF's posture is based on realistic assessment and um, is, you know, we, we talked a lot about Japan's capabilities and missile developments, um, but, you know, it's not just about adding new capabilities. It's also about, um, you know, improving jointness of the self-defense forces. So there's a lot of things that you can do in the operation. So what was really interesting, um, no, what, what, what was really important about the new strategic documents is that Japan also released alongside a national security strategy, a national defense strategy, which is based on Japan's uh, assessment and also exercises and simulations in-house on um, actual war fighting on how Japan will fight um, if there will be a major contingency or aggression in Japan. So the new strategy is based on how to fight rather than the previous version of, of um, Japan's uh, you know, national defense documents, which is called the National Defense Procurement Guideline, which only kind of, um, you know, which was a document that would inform um, the, the public and the government um, about, you know, how what the size of the, the, the Japanese self Defense forces was so that kind of major shift in think uh, major um, shift in in how Japan approaches its budget um, and defense capability is already an important um, you know factor um, and it's, and it's it's and, and so that itself is itself is very important to strengthen um, and prepare the Japanese self defense forces. And in terms of the actual, you know, personnel, of course, you know, we've been seeing um, almost like every week about how significant this demographic 
and structural challenges um, for Japan and, and what that might mean for um, the Japanese self defense forces. But that was also that, that such concern was also um, quite prevalent in the in the new national um, security documents, and we've seen uh, an increase a significant increase on R and D, especially around uh, new domains, um, you know, cyberspace and electromagnetics, but also on technology developments around. Um, also investments in autonomous technology. So this is also an area that the Japanese self-defense force has been focusing on um, when it is already facing major recruitment challenges. So how to make um, its assets more autonomous and, and, and how to, how to train Japanese self-defense forces um, to, to be able to use these new, new type of assets is, is, is a new, new, um, new task for the Japanese um, self-defense force, which is, was also earmarked in, in the Japanese um, budget. So of course there are challenges and, you know, Again, like doubling the defense budget itself is is going to and how to actually implement that at pace is is a is a big big task for Japan. Um, but at least the documents itself um, signals that Japan is trying to um, change um, the, the the shift in its its way of approaching national security to address these issues. I'll stop there. Thank you, Yuka. Um, uh, Lionel, from the three points you made at the very beginning. One that I found very interesting is, is, is the last one you made, which was that um, you know the the defense, the new defense posture in Japan, the military buildup would inevitably end up sort of weakening uh, Japan's role as an economic anchor uh, to the region, which has been, and I think again, this is probably not a disputed point in this round here, which has been incredibly important and beneficial to the region over over the last few decades. And I do want to, for the sake of discussion, take issue with that statement and, and ask you why is it so clear to you? That Japan can't do both. Like, what is there? There's, there's not necessarily any evidence that a country couldn't be an economic anchor to a region while also having a, a strong self-defense. All right. Thanks for the thanks for the question. Uh, well, I, I guess my point was more about the uh, geopolitical alignment or the margin of maneuver Japan will be left with uh, if it focuses politically on basically becoming a regional security actor because you can mention about the the three documents uh, i mean one of the key aspects in these three documents especially the national security strategy that i have seen is is really the uh, now a japan that is that is openly saying well we will shape the regional environment uh, so we see that with the first strategy to be honest in 2013 but it was pretty vaguely worded now we have a strategy in which japan seems to be uh, assuming the role of uh, a shaper of the regional environment what i'm worrying with that is that japan has is basically aiming at becoming this shaper of regional dynamics but with a very strong anchoring to the U.S. alliance. Of course, in terms of defense strategy, there is absolutely no doubt that Japan needs to reinforce the alliance with the United States. The problem I see is that um, the polarization of the international system that we have seen accelerating since the war in Ukraine and in Europe, it is now crystal clear that the, the continent is polarized, is slowly spreading toward East Asia. And what I'm worrying uh, as a European is that depolarization will actually cut the bridges uh, between the different, I will say, tectonic, tectonic plague, plate of the, uh, of the region, uh, making communication much more difficult, making mis misunderstanding and misperception much more, much higher. Um, and, and, and Japan, in this regard, uh, had played uh, during the Cold War a key role in actually bridging the different blocks, I will say. Uh, and again, if you remember the 1970s, the early 1970s with Kissinger, Nixon going to China, rapprochement, etc., we should not forget that actually, of course, it was a one of the Nixon trucks for Japan. So therefore, it was a surprise that Kissinger visited uh, China in the summer of 71. On the other hand, Japan was key in actually maintaining constructive people-to-people -people exchanges with the People's Republic of China since the end of basically the civil war in China until the late 1960s and then in the 1970s. In other words, Japan has always played during the Cold War a role of bridge between the American ally uh, and the other side, I would say, of the iron curtail in Asia, if I can talk that way. Now, Japan wanting to assume a very proactive role of regional shaper in Asia, but actually making it clear that it will be 
something, a role that is played on the side of the United States, actually put Japan in a position in which it will be much more difficult for Tokyo to reach out to other countries mm. to act, I, I will say, as a, as a stabilizer, as a solution finder, uh, because we see that Beijing and Washington, this is a surprise for nobody, uh, are in a confrontational course today. Uh, and I think much more effective for regional stability will be a Japan that actually is able to play the middle role. Uh, mm. And when I read through these documents, I see that Japan is not playing that, actually. Yeah. It is yeah. taking side rather than actually staying in the middle, at the middle, yeah. I will say. Yeah. Yeah. So w w what you're saying is Japan would be Japan as a middle, as a balancing power uh, would be more effective or, or better for regional stability. I do want to turn to some questions from the audience. We've, we've gotten so many. Thank you, everybody, for submitting them. We'll, we'll try to get um, to as many as we can in, in the 10 minutes or so that we have. And Ken, the first one is uh, for you, and, and I'm reading it here in part um, uh, from the submission, um, says that uh, it, it, the question is about both public opinion in Japan towards the military buildup, as well as sort of constitutionality. Um, of course, Japan has a constitution um, uh, that uh, that focuses focuses only on on, on self defense, uh, famous Article Nine. Um, so there have been uh, polls polls recently have shown that an increasing number of Japanese people do favor the military buildup, but they do not favor. Um, revising the constitution in, 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 in any such way. What is your reading on public opinion in this matter in Japan? To which extent is the, is the Japanese population, you know, still behind the plans that have been outlined? Where and is there sort of a red line um, that both in terms of public opinion and constitutionality, Japan will or should not be able to cross uh, when it comes to defense posture? All right, thank you. So um, the conclusion uh, first, uh, Japan will probably not change the constitution or Article 9 uh, because it doesn't have to. Uh, in 2050, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe um, implemented some new laws um, that interpret um, collective self-defense uh, in a different way. Now, um, Japan can help uh, America uh, in its battles, um, because Japan, uh, America is crucial to Japan's defense. In until then, um, Japan could only uh, use its self-defense force to protect the Japanese territory. But under the 2015 law revisions, now Japan can fight side by side with America if America is in crisis. Um, going back to the basics, the, the, the core of Japan's security strategy, to make it very simple, is to make sure that the U.S. is committed to defending Japan. Uh, one, uh, a visible example of that is the U.S. military bases in Japan. There are 55,000 uh, American soldiers based in Japan, which is the largest contingent anywhere in the world. Uh, so it's crucial for Japan to make sure that America stays uh, in Japan because that's the best defense. And how to do that is to show that Japan is willing to fight. Japan took lessons from both Ukraine and from the Afghanistan uh, situation. Uh, when the Afghanistani troops uh, were no longer willing to fight, then America was not willing to fight. But if, like in Ukraine, if Ukraine is willing to fight, then America, along with the NATO allies, is ready to support. So Japan took lessons from that. And part of the buildup is to show, is, is not necessarily to invade China and take Chinese territory. It's more like showing the US that Japan is committed um, to defending itself. Also, the other side of the strategy is to build a coalition of like-minded countries um, to encourage America to stay in this region. Um, the, there was a, uh, some topics uh, of can Japan uh, sustain the budget and have the personnel uh, to build this military state. Well, of course, the goal is not to build a military state, it's to show America that we're committed and also to build a coalition. And the reason why uh, Japan is willing to spend more money is because um, the international order, the free, trade, uh, free, free flow of trade and uh, energy is crucial uh, to Japan to sustain growth uh, as the population declines. If China, uh, Japan is worried that if China is allowed to build a new order um, that centers not around uh, international rule of law, but the size of the country, then China uh, might use its clout to, for instance, um, 
tell the Southeast Asian countries, if you want to be part of my sphere, then don't do business with Japan, uh, until Japan also bends its knee too. So uh, that kind of new order um, will um, hamper Japan's growth. That's why Japan is um, committed um, to building these um, deterrence um, capabilities at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ken. And, and, and I think you, you raise an important point here also uh, with the role of the U.S., which, of course, is incredibly important here. Um, and, and, and with your argument that, uh, you know, a, a part of what Japan is doing is also uh, to be perceived as a signaling towards the U.S. that, uh, that, uh, that Japan is willing to do its part. Um, and, and so I want to I wanna bring in another audience question. And, 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 Sean, I'll put this to you because I, I saw you typing an answer to, to a similar audience question earlier, but maybe not everybody has seen this online. So... Is part of what's going on here, and it's part of the reason why Japan sort of feels compelled uh, to build up its, its, its military and to alter its defense posture, also that, uh, quite frankly, the U.S. has become a less reliable partner in security for the country than it was maybe 10, 20 years ago. And uh, there may be certain worries that, depending on who's president in the U.S., come uh, late 2024, that reliability might uh, decrease even further, uh, right? So is that also kind of the, is one of the shifts that we're seeing that sort of has triggered this also um, just a less reliable security partner in the US? Thanks, Nico. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think that um, the the specter of a future President Trump, which was mentioned in the, the q and I can certainly say here in South Korea, is something that is factored in, if not in public statements, then in private conversations. It's just a reality that the rest of the world uh, has to sort of deal with because that was very destabilizing in particular in particular for U.S. allies since you had a U.S. president who was quite openly uh, either mercenary or or negative in his view of alliances. So uh, just like I, I think we Lionel Lionel and I are sympathetic to the Japan's quandary in that you have a region which I mean South Korea again to use example here is. Uh, spending a lot, I would say too much. If if we were debating that proposition, uh, South Korea is building up too quickly and spending too much on defense. Um, so no one is arguing, we are not arguing Japan is to blame or the cause of this. And again, it's very understandable that uh, Japanese strategists are concerned about long-term US reliability. The question is, how do you handle that? And to suddenly dramatically increase your defense spending by 26% shows a lack of of sort of prudence, you know, it shows a lack of a, of a stable, long-term understanding. Japan made a deep commitment to being a pacifist country that's been, you know, such a such a great benefit to the region and to the world. To jettison that because of the fear of, you know, a future four years of President uh, Trump or something else in terms of U.S. domestic politics seems like a, a terrible mistake uh, for Japan and a very dangerous choice for the rest of the region. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we're already very quickly running out of time on, on the Q&A. Um, if I may quickly. Yes, please. You yes, go ahead. Talk, thank you. Um, because we're, I think, a lot of the audience is from U uh, Europe, I just also wanted to um, pu push back a little bit on the notion um, that there's a kind of, because of the lack of trust in the alliance, Japan is, you know, um, trying to increase its, its defense to have it, to um, enhance its own self-defense. But it, it's, so it's different. It's actually different from the European um, argument of strategic autonomy. And there's actually high level trust in U.S. alliance and the, um, the, the alliance itself is in a um, good state uh, right now. But there are, is, of course, um, even in the U.S. that the um, U.S. cannot, you know, just uh, uh, the, U the U.S. cannot um, you, you cannot just rely on the U.S. to counter or balance against China. So there's this, you know, in, in the U.S., the concept of integrated de uh, deterrence. But there's a lot of discussion going on between a U.S. And, and regional alliances in Asia, like Japan, U.S., but Japan, uh, U.S., Australia, Australia, that is triggering trilateral, for instance, cooperation among U.S. alliance network uh, partners to network the bilateral U.S. alliances to enhance defense cooperation and counter against China. So it's different. I just wanted to emphasize the fact that it's different that you know it's not like japan is not trusting us so it's trying to um, enhance its own defense capabilities thank you very much and that actually does bring us to the uh to the end of the q a time so uh thank you again uh, to the audience for all your questions and 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 we hope we we're able to to shed some light 
Um, I, I do think from everything we've heard so far that kind of like the default line in this debate is very much uh, between whether the military buildup in Japan is kind of, if not needlessly, then at least carelessly endangering a regional stability that has served the region very well um, over the, the last decades, or whether Japan's military buildup is merely uh, the right and perhaps the only reasonable reaction to the major changes that, of course, are going on the way in the region. I think that's the uh, that's the core of the discussion and, and the question that we're discussing. And I'm looking forward um, to uh, the closing statements um, um, of all of our four panelists wrapping up um, their respective arguments. Uh, the order is the same than in the beginning, uh, which means that we'll start with the team arguing in favor of the motion and Lionel Faton in Geneva, who has two minutes uh, for his closing statements, please. All right, thank you. Nico, um, I just want would like to come back to one arg argument that Yuka has made about the fact that, well, the the Japanese defense military buildup is purely defensive. Um, I will tend to agree, to be honest. Uh, and even when we conceptualize the counter strike capabilities, it is quite sure that actually, even though some folks in the LDP were for pushing for preemptive uh, operational concepts. It has never basically, it's not, never something that has gained momentum. So even counter-strike capabilities, I see them as defensive. That I agree completely. Uh, now the point is that it, it's not that important whether the intention of Japan is to build in a dis defensively oriented man manner. It's, it's rather a matter of perception from the other countries that are to be deterred by the Japanese military buildup. Uh, and here I will be much more cautious um, about basically saying, well, Japan perceived Japan military buildup as something that is purely defensive. Uh, and one reason why is that I think Japan has been in such a hurry to actually compile these three documents to basically make sure that all the different social and political actors are actually behind this push to increase defense budget and defense capabilities in a very, very short period of time, uh, has, has failed to communicate pro uh, properly to the audience. So yes, UK, you mentioned many countries welcome, at least officially, what Japan as basically ambition to do. Uh, but let me just take an example, what I see extremely problematic for the regional stability. Uh, you aim to deter China from revisionist move, being in the East China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, and et cetera. But you do not provide any alternative to China to uh, military competition. In other words, you build up. You basically prepare for war, but you do not say China, well, if you do not move with revisionist intents, then we have an alternative that is much better and peaceful. This is a point that China, uh, that Japan has not made. And I think because this Japan was too much in a hurry to develop its military well, power, forgetting diplomacy. Thank you. I have to, I have to thank you very much. Um, um, let's move it right along. Closing statements from the team arguing against the motion. Uh, Yuka Koshino joining us from London, please. Two minutes as well. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I think I would like to um, tackle the two remaining arguments around one on, you know, which is actually changing um, the geopolitical environment or, or the status quo. And again, I think uh, my, my partner Ken has made it very clear that uh, the purpose of Japan's military buildup is to restore the power balance. So I think we heard several arguments from the um, the, the group that was for um, this motion that, uh, you know, this is the most significant military development uh, since since the post-war period that will change on um, the balance of power. But I would argue back saying that it's China actually that has changed the status quo and Japan not doing enough over the past decade, even despite the, for instance, double digit increase of defense spending in, in the 20, you know, 10s um, by China. Japan keeping very static defense. So the rush itself is kind of the fact that Japan is trying to play catch up. So I think it's still not convincing to hear that, uh, you know, convincing in terms of um, that Japan is kind of rushing or overbalancing against China. It was actually inefficient. And the second point about, you know, how the perception as Lionel just made, and I think um, John also mentioned about how the region perceives and how uh, the region will um, react to it. I think actually the fact that, you know, Many times when Japan releases new defense documents, um, we got responses from South Korea. Um, but this time, I think what was different is that we didn't get a real, you know, uh, we actually 
um, got a quite a receptive reaction from South Korea about even when Japan is going to ch historic change a historic policy change on counter strike capability that ex that shows how the region's um, security environment has deteriorated and Japan's um, defense capability and cooperation with partners, including Japan, uh, ROK, um, U.S. cooperation is is essential for security. And finally, I think I wanted to um, emphasize the point that Japan is actually still playing, a, trying to play a balancing power. And you mentioned about the polarization, but Japan is still, you know, open to dialogue and has been meeting with Xi Jinping, um, high, high level of China to pursue this dialogue and, of course, dipl putting diplomacy first. And Japan's national security strategy, also, I would mention that actually laid out other, you know, elements of power like economic power, technology power, intelligence, you know, aside from defense uh, to pursue its security. So I would right. um, kind of push back on the fact that, uh, you know, Japan is only focusing on defense. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuka Kushino. Uh, perfect. Um, and then uh, we'll hear the closing statement um, uh, from the second closing statement from team arguing in favor of the motion. John Delury in Seoul, you have two minutes. Thanks, Nico. I'm going to try to get back to keeping time here um, <laughs> because I, I, you know, I want to keep it simple here at the end. I think that I'm trained as a historian, and I think that this question has an almost technical level, but uh, we really are at one of these possible hinge points of history. You know, people are talking about a second Cold War. Some argue we're already in a second Cold War. Um, the, the U.S. government is constantly out there talking about the post-1945 international rules-based order and how we have to defend that. And I, I think what this debate really gets us to focus on is the extraordinary role that Japan has played and, and the credit that Japan deserves for being the cornerstone of the East Asian peace, as, as Lano mentioned, you know, as scholars discuss it, and the economic miracles that we've seen successive countries. Japan was the blueprint of that. Throughout the Cold War, Japan was sort of the ballast um, for for this region, and um, it, it is. It, there was some discussion in the chat about, "Hey, wait a second! As we recover from the pandemic, don't we need to be focused on economic development and human health?" And we do. And Japan has been one of, if not the leading countries, to keep its priorities straight because of the constraint that it made upon itself that it took since 1945 to be a pacifist country. That's a very courageous decision. And there have been times throughout Japanese history where there have been a temptation like this to break with that path. It would be a terrible mistake. I haven't heard any argument um, that I think, as good as some of them are, that convinces us that it's really time for Japan to break from its tradition of, of pacifism. The implications of that, not only for Japan, for, but for this region, there's no question in my mind that they will be destabilizing and lead us to, to a much bleaker world than the one that we're in now, again, largely thanks to the decisions Japan has made generation after generation since 1945. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Delury. Um, and of course, uh, the, the final words, the final closing statements belong to the team arguing against the motion um, and to Ken Moriasu in Doha. Ken, you have the final Thank you. Um, so I want to end with an analogy, um, and it's uh, related to Japanese onsens, the hot springs. So as everybody knows, and I think you've experienced, in a hot spring, you have to wash yourself and uh, shampoo yourself before going into the bathtub. And um, I think uh, what Japan is trying to say to, to China is you have to obey by the rules. Uh, China is a very rich uh, person who comes to this onsen and tries to go into the tub without washing. And we're saying, oh, please wash. And then it's like China saying, well, um, if you're worried about the water getting dirty, then why don't I um, install a huge desalination uh, facility next to the bath so we can boil water, pump water, and um, pour water into it so that the water is always clean. And Japan is saying, well, that, that's like, that's not what a hot, hot sand is supposed to be. So I, I think um, what Japan is trying to do is not change China or uh, democratize China, but having China to play by the rules. And uh, as long as they um, come into the onsen and, and obey by the rules, then it doesn't matter how rich they are or how loud they are, it doesn't matter. And I think, um, uh, I think uh, Leonel talked about Japan not offering an alternative path. I think the, the strategy is if um, China agrees to play by the international rules, 
then Japan would happily um, go back to the pacifist uh, pillar of the region and focus on bridging um, the differences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken Mariasu. Um, and that ends the Oxford debate of today on Japan's military buildup. Uh, as you are well aware, of course, it's now time for the second and deciding vote. Um, I will launch the poll, uh, which you should see on your screen now. The question is the same. Do you agree or disagree with today's motion, which is Japan's military buildup is threatening regional stability. And because we've talked a lot today and you've heard many arguments, uh, we're gonna let you vote in peace and silence for about 45 seconds uh, before we close. Thank you. Um, I'm now being told that the results uh, for today's debate are available. Um, and I'm asking the team to show them to us on screen. I have not seen them before. Um, so in the first poll, 64% um, disagreed with the motion, 19% uh, agreed. Um, in the second poll, uh, uh, very interesting. So both, uh, both teams gained votes. Um, this is very unusual, doesn't happen very often. Um, the change was that five more people agreed, or 5% more agreed uh, with the motion in the second poll than the beginning, and 9% more people agreed, uh, disagreed with the motion um, at the end, which means that even though both sides have uh, have gained votes um, in the second poll, the team arguing against the motion, that is uh, Yuka Koshino and Ken Moriyasu, has gained more votes, which means that they are the winners of this Oxford debate today. Congratulations, uh, Yuka-san. Congratulations, Ken-san. Uh, well done. And of course, congratulations also to John um, and, and, and Lionel. Uh, while, you not we, while you may not have won the debate, um, you have also picked up votes. So again, um, both sides have done a fantastic job uh, bringing over their arguments. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Today. Um, as I've mentioned, if you are an Asia Society Switzerland member, you can join us in a separate debriefing meeting where we'll talk about uh, all about what this means uh, with the speakers. Uh, we'll be starting in a minute or two. You should have received a separate dial-in link by email as well. Um, everyone else, we will see you very soon. And if you have any feedback on this event, uh, we deeply appreciate if you share it with us by filling out the feedback form. Uh, you will see a link uh, to it once you exit this webinar, um, or you will also see it in the thank you email that you should receive within the hour. We deeply appreciate it. It helps us make these events even better. Thank you again um, to all the panelists and the teams. Thank you to joining uh, to the audience for joining us. Um, and we do hope to see you all very, very soon.